All right, um, let's get going with our Grace Talks because I'm gonna get you out of here by 11.45. Um, we've got an esteemed panel today. In fact, I'm a little intimidated. We got three doctors and a pastor. Uh, so we have Dr. David Green, psychologist, clinical director of New Life Resources and adjunct professor. Dr. Mark Chapman, assistant professor of theology at Marquette University. Dr. Lee Seitzma, he has written Universal Salvation and Freedom of Choice uh, according to Origin. Uh, and uh, he also teaches at the beloved Brookfield Christian School. And then Pastor Young Kwong, thank you, fabulous job at uh, introducing the topic today. So I'm gonna start with a question and let each of these answer, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. And I've got some more questions if we don't, we don't get enough, but I think we'll have plenty of questions. So my first question for each one of you is, why does this doctrine matter? Okay, why does it matter? And how does it influence your ministry, whether it's ministering to youth, whether it's Christian counseling, whether it's teaching? How, do you, how does it influence your ministry? And how do you like, teach students who believe in moralistic therapeutic deism the doctrine of total depravity in the gospel? So let's start. Um, Pastor Yung Kwong. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Uh, it is important because it points to our need for Christ. Um, unless you realize that you cannot save yourself from the predicament that you're in, that is this fallen, fallenness or human sinfulness, um, you, there's really no need to come to church and learn about God. There's no really any need for a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no need for any of that. Um, this need is what brings us to Christ. And in my work that I do with youth, it's especially important because, I mean, what therapeutic, a moralistic therapeutic deism implies and does is that it puts weight on your own shoulder. Like, you're putting this weight on your own shoulder, and you have to be the savior of yourself. And the gospel says that, no, 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 no. I mean, you can try that, but you're just going to fail. But here's a better solution. We have... God who died for you, who has gotten rid of that weight off your shoulder. Um, so, yeah. Dan? Um, I, think, I think it's relevant uh, at a very practical level in that people confuse being good with being loved. Um, we need to be loved. We need to love others, to be loved by others, to receive and to give love. And the a uh, counterfeit for that is to be good enough where we think at least I'm upping the odds that I will be loved, um, which is a bucket with a great big hole in it. No matter how much people pour in trying to be good enough to be loved, they aren't. And so we see great struggles with perfectionism, with addictions, with trying to comfort or calm ourselves, and um, chronic failure. So, so I would see that this uh, total inability, when, when we accept that, it's like, ah, pressure's off. And it's a complete reorganization about life. Lee? It's always funny to me how controversial this one is. Of, of all five, I feel this one is the most demonstrably true. Just so self-evidently true. An um, article came out in the uh, Times 10 years ago or so, and scientists discovered that little babies learn to manipulate and lie to their parents from the earliest possible moments, before they can speak. <laughs> this has now been documented, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is so surprising. And not, not so much. <laughs> Um, the reason why this one is important is because although it's so self-evidently true, Jesus spent more of his energies on this one, teaching people this one, than anything else. He came and he held out a cure, and everyone's like, that's fantastic. Go, go give the cure to those people who need it. And Jesus had to spend so much of his time saying, you, you're the ones who need it. I mean, the parable of the prodigal son has been misnamed for thousands of years. 
that parable is the parable of the older brother. Mm -hmm. It's not about the younger son. The younger son knew he needed salvation and he found it. The parable ends with the older good brother not finding it. And the people in Jesus' audience when he's giving the parable of the older brother are the older brothers. It's the good people of Israel who are so glad that Jesus is ministering to the, the worthless, but they don't need it. So this is the starting point. Um, shouldn't be controversial, but it is. Great, Mark. Yeah, I love the parable of the two brothers. Uh, I always use that when I'm teaching uh, because it's really remarkable how, 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 how we misread that parable. Oh, it's the parable of the loving father embracing the sinner. Um, well, Jesus didn't end there, <laughs> the story. The story continues. Uh, but, you know, total depravity is so important because it stops us from looking to ourselves, uh, which is a hopeless task. Uh, and a task that, again, in our environment, you know, moralistic therapeutic deism has a pretty low bar, actually, for how good you have to be, <laughs> uh, frankly. But um, it is looking to yourself. And even most religious folks, I mean, most of the people that I see in my classes uh, have some exposure to the church, maybe grew up in the church, and they still look to themselves. <laughs> you know, they just seek their own self-righteousness, uh, which is a burden, right? It makes, I mean, that's what makes religion a burden. That's why people walk away from religion, is it's tiresome. Um, and you know, it's at the heart of the gospel that there's a gift for us that we didn't earn. So that's, that's powerful and we can get that across to people. Um, you know, it makes Christianity a lot more attractive. But I suppose how, how it affects how I teach too is that it, essential to being a Christian is humility. It's absolutely essential. And there's so many people that go around prideful. I mean, we all know prideful Christians. And the way that we look down our nose is at those people. Um, it always makes me think of the story Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector go to the temple to pray, right? The Pharisees, thank you, God. <laughs> I'm such a great guy. <laughs> and, you know, over in the corner, you know, the lowly tax collector, the most despicable job you could have, um, beats his breast and just says, have mercy on me, Lord. And when you have that heart for that kind of gospel, that you are there only by the grace of God, and by the grace of God, you are given that gift, it colors how you look at everything and how you treat other people. You know, so how you treat people outside of the faith, you know, you have to have that humility. People sense that pride a mile away, and it's repulsive, <laughs> actually. So. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a list of questions, but what are your questions? Any questions from the audience? I can repeat them, or I can share the mic. Right here, let's get one. Mary? Why do we want to try to be good at all, then? Hmm. Who wants to tackle it? Why do we try to be good at all, then? My understanding on that would be made in the image of God. We are, we're, we're looking for, we're motivated towards good, towards love. Um, we don't have to teach a child to want to be loved. They come pre-wired that way. And so I do believe that we are seeking good. And even people involved in what most would say is very evil, in their mind, it's good. That it's it's part of our created being. Hmm. Yeah, excellent. Now, well, so I mean, we're not Christians because we follow a set of rules. And I tell my students too, Christianity is not about being good. <laughs> In a strange kind of way, it's not. I mean, it is. But the difference is, are you being good to earn your salvation? Or is it out of joy for your creator and who you were made to be that you take joy in being good, that you, you're rewired to do good and to be good? Um, sure, we're meant to be good, and we ought to do good, but we do it out of a thankfulness, not out mm -hmm. of 
earning our righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. fundamentally different orientations. Yeah, yeah. excellent, great. Other questions? Okay, yeah, Chris. In the parable of the prodigal, the younger son comes home and he's saying, Father, you know, just give me a place, make me a slave. The father gives him everything. The parable doesn't really say that I can recall that the son gets it, that he accepts that position back. And I think that that's something that uh, people struggle with too, is they recognize it, they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they're still questioning. Can, all right, I'm, I'm in heaven, but I still don't even be, deserve mm -hmm. to be a slave. I, if I can answer that question, I, 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 there was no question, so I'm not answering any question, but I'm adding to your point, I guess. Um, um, New Testament scholar Kenneth Bailey wrote a, a wonderful book on that parable, um, and in that book he points out that that is not a separate parable that it should be read um, in an isolation. It should be read with the lost coin parable and the lost sheep parable because those, th those three parables is actually uh, one single parable. Um, if you go back to the actual text, it says Jesus told a parable. Um, so it's those three stories make up one parable that gives us an idea of how the father comes to the lost, whether it's lost sheep, coin, or the lost son. So it's the father that runs out to the younger son when he's still far out, far out in the countryside, and he brings that younger son into the house, and he throws a, um, a party. And that, that, to me, is this idea of what God's grace looks like, right? It's God reaching out to us, grabbing us, and sometimes dragging us into his house and um, because we have this brokenness we often don't want to go into the house and that's the the picture that we see in the older son sometimes right um, that yeah mm -hmm. um, I, th I think a feature there also is the a consequence of sin is this concept this concept that it's about deserving or not deserving and love comes from the lover God loves us. That's that's his issue. <laughs> he loves us. He gives it to us. And do we receive or not receive? That is um, very humbling, as, as was mentioned earlier, to, to be in a position of I can receive it. Um, this was highlighted when my grandson was born. I was holding about 10 minutes into his earthly life. And I realized this kid's going to be loved and he doesn't get to vote on it. He's, he's going to be loved, he's going to be cared for, he's going to be invested in. And we're just earthly grandparents and parents. Our Heavenly Father loves us. And that changes the whole dynamic of what's good. Um, it moves off what I'm doing to who he is and what he's given me. Yeah, excellent. We've got time for one, maybe two more. Really, I don't really have a question. I just am thinking about Peter's sermon today uh, and how in our culture now, oftentimes we have a very low view of God and a high view of ourself. And so I guess the question to ask people who this moralistic theistic view is who are you comparing yourself to? Yeah, great point, Pam. That, that really is really is true. We compare ourselves to, you know, uh, the worst of the worst, not to God's holy standards. Other questions? In the back. Oh, Al. I'm going to do the Phil Donahue thing here. <laughs> That's good for your knee. <laughs> so... Uh, Total depravity. The, one of the main issues I have with the doctrine is how it trickles down to those of us in the congregation and sometimes how I hear Christians respond and react to things they view in the world. And I think part of the, part of the problem I have 
uh, is that there are good things that are done, oftentimes in my view, by non-Christians, and believers don't want to give any credence to it. They, you know, they'll say things like, well, that person isn't saved, so that can't be a good work. Or, well, they're, you know, we don't really know where their heart was at. It was probably coming from a selfish point of view. I saw a lot of this, what I would call uh, natural goodness coming out during the pandemic without regard to people's belief systems. And it seems to me if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, we should call it a duck. Comments? This is one reason why I like the canons of Dort so much. It goes into that exact issue. It affirms that good deeds are being done all the time. But what the canons of Dort does is it helpfully peers back the curtain and says, if you look at the totality of this good deed, the person's motivation for doing it, is this a salvific good? So it's not denying that there's tons of good deeds happening, but is this a, a deed that deserves salvation? And that's where the canons of Dort draws the line. And I think it's very biblical. Um, one of my favorite assignments that I do with my students at BCS is we, we do a dive into Proverbs 21.2. All the ways of a man seems good to his eyes, but the Lord knows the heart. And so what we do is we list some of our good deeds that we're proud of, and we affirm the goodness of them. And then we look at some of our hidden motivations for doing those deeds. So I always lead with my own example. When I was in high school, um, I volunteered all day Saturday at a soup kitchen. And I was proud of that. And I think it really was a good deed. I'm not denying that it was a good deed. It was later in life when I started to know myself better and I started to reflect on my motivations for my good deeds. And I happen to remember that, well, I was going to be filling out college applications real soon, and I didn't have a lot to put down on that box that says <laughs> extracurricular service projects. And, and boy, did I like to tell people about this soup kitchen experience. Oh, my goodness, that feels good. Um, and so I'm not negating that I did a good deed. I fed hungry people. But if I'm honest with myself, there are hidden tainted motivations lurking in the background that it hurts to admit to myself. And students picked up on this very, very quickly. They're very wise. And so students began to talk about some of their service projects and other opportunities, and they reflect that these are good. And they started to open up with me about some of their hidden motivations for doing these things in a very honest way it was beautiful and we realized together that we're doing good deeds but they're not to the level of salvific goods they're not 100 percent motivated by love of god and neighbor that's total depravity yeah. great thank you we are out of time we will pick it up next week we'll look at the you unconditional election chosen by god that won't be controversial at all. All right, we'll see you next week. Thank you.